the title of the talk is Onanistic Engenderings. Thanks for accepting our invite. The floor is yours. Thanks, Adil. I do feel very old about, uh, after this presentation, but <laughs> thanks for the introduction. That's, um, it's great. And thanks for having me. Thanks, Jorge. Thanks, Adil. Thanks, Miguel. And uh, thanks, Vera and Nutger also. I don't think they're there, but um, for the opportunity. Um, so I don't know if everyone sees me well. I'll do the ritualistic kind of sharing the screen and then probably getting it wrong and then starting again. I don't know what you see. You should be seeing mud. Okay, all right, good. Um, so it, tonight's talk is something like a, an improvisation and it's um, a collection of episodes really and of a bit of a scattered thoughts, um, which picks up on the, on the theme of uh, this season's uh, this season of the studio, so in genderings, and I kind of, um, yeah, just took the opportunity to connect to a couple of thoughts I had this summer when I saw an exhibition by a, an artist named Laura Gauzelon. Uh, uh, she presented a, a show called An Onanis, Onanism Sorcery, sorry, uh, in which she presented a series of um, videos called Youth Enhancement Systems. Uh, and I think I will show you a little bit just before I start, but so the one of the sentences her character says in the videos is once you get out of the mud, you have a name. And really, it really stuck with me throughout the summer and I didn't really um, elaborate on it and I thought it would be a perfect kind of um, way to to enter into this engendering uh, theme. So maybe just to start, I can kind of give you an idea of what this video was about. <laughs> we were living in the Salt City, drinking and eating from each other's mouth. We were living in the Salt City, Eating and drinking from each other's mouth. Once you get out of the mud, you have a name. We were hiding in the Swarp City. Once you get out of the mud, you have a name. I had a strange dream. I was duplicating myself. I had a strange dream. I was duplicating. Okay, so I think you kind of get the idea of the flavor or the ambiance of the movie. Um, so in this series of videos, um, Laura portrays mum. So it's Laura you're seeing, she's heavily kind of uh, made up obviously. And um, she portrays mum, which is a feminine character with a grave, almost transgender voice as you could hear. And she's uh, kind of smoking a, a decoction from a water pipe. Uh, she does that in all the movies. And that decoction is something between a zombie drug and an elixir of eternal use. And mum is old, as you see. She's unsound and yet she is uh, standing strong and profoundly desiring, which is part of the kind of malaise you get in the show. But what she's doing in some of the videos is that she's masturbating and she's masturbating hard, she's masturbating uh, like fast and long, and she's extremely high in all possible ways. She flounts her vivid desire, parades her libidinal autonomy all over the place, and uh, she does that with a devastating force that one can see in her decomposed face, as well as uh, with, you know, sense and touch uh, that you can experience in the exhibition, in all the fluids that composed uh, that exhibition, that composed the show, most of which frozen in the viscous and uh, kind of fleshy um, sculptures uh, that, that you see in the show, but also resolved in the smoke and in the heavy breath that fills the air in the movies. So in those movies, 
Mum appears as an archaic mother who watches over creatures to come, creatures that would be the fruit of an obscure complex process of transubstantiation. This process is what I want to start from to tell, as I was saying a few episodes on the idea of engendering, of onanism, of procreation, uh, and also something about maybe names, which I think is something that uh, Vera already um, addressed in her original uh, initial lecture. So with this line that stuck with me, which is once you get out of the mud, you have a name. And this is actually a sentence that Laura um, borrows from Burroughs, so the, the famous poet. Uh, and it comes from the last chapter of the Soft Machine book, which is, I don't know if you've read it, but this uh, uh, complex, uh, multi-layered um, prose, prose poem about something like transubstantiation, transformation, metamorphosis. And in the book, there's this recurrent element of mud that uh, is quite central to the process that Burroughs tells about, which is something in between death, decay, generation, disappearance, and all of that together. So what kind of strikes me in the sentence, which is pronounced by this uh, hegemonic figure of mum, is the affirmation of some sort of cutting or interruption of the paternalistic lineage of the father's name. And indeed, proper names uh, encapsulate genealogies, and they are, so to say, encodings of bloodlines, of you know, family histories and inheritances, and they encode that through letters and sounds. And somehow that encoding allows for the father's lineage to be preserved in time. So here there is a name which is given, there is a process of engendering at work, but not one of procreation. So it doesn't work through mating, but rather through some sort of diversion. It, it stems from a different source than the biological one. And it stems from uh, the feminine fluid and not from the masculine semen, so to say. So, and I would think of that as a gendering precisely because it suggests uh, uh, an originating or a sudden and immediate birth rather than a gradual you know bringing into the fullness of life and uh, the fullness of being um, and so there is indeed a sexual act but one which one one which is i'm sorry um kind of a, a mimetic or, 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 or looped uh, and as i was saying it's not mating uh, and this engendering therefore takes its source in onanism and not in copulation so mud um, because I, she talks about it, Burroughs talks about it, it's here in the background. And mud, as you may know, has a kind of dual symbolism um, attached to it. So etymologically, you have two etymologies, the first one coming from Welsh, which gives uh, bawa, which will then give, for example, boo in French. But you also have an etymology that connects to the idea of dirt and moisture, which is the uh, German, uh, you know, mud, mudder, I'm sorry, I'm pro probably pronouncing that wrong, the mother in Dutch or the Greek midos. And this, the materiality of the, of mud actually kind of reinforces this idea, this neg negative dimension of the impure component because it's precisely composed of decomposed organisms and excrements and, and whatnot. However, um, it's precisely from this impurity that mud also gets uh, its fertile power, no? so its generative capacity. Mud is soil, which is uh, in a way, um, yeah, soil and water, which kind of enhance each other. So soil is fecundated by water, which uh, itself is fertilized by soil. So it's kind of this uh, exchange and this um, um, impure uh, mixture. So mud, in this case of this uh, um, engendering that I want to think about, is in a way the substrate, the substratum. It is the material on which another material is coated or fabricated. And in philosoph philosophical terms, it is the underlying characterless substance that supports attributes of material reality. And mud obviously carries a kind of a heavy symbolic 
and um, religious um, force or power or weight, let's say. Um, and it's, it's precisely connected to engendering, so that to this giving birth, to this giving form and name without copulation. And the best example of it is obviously from the Genesis, the um, creation of Adam, which is from the mud. Something you also find in Koran, uh, in which um, Adam is uh, said to be brought out of a kind of a sticky mud, which is tin latib. And in the Genesis, obviously, what is said is that the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So, and because Adam could not be left alone, alone, sorry, God also created animals, created plants, again, from that same mud. Still from the Genesis, it says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. And indeed here, as things are formed out of the mud, they are given a name, something I already uh, mentioned briefly. And I'll come back to that difference between having a name and being given a name. And it, it, what's quite interesting, I was um, uh, attending a, a lecture by um, the, the kind of philosopher and, and, and author um, uh, Manguel uh, last week or two weeks ago, where he precisely talked about this giving a name, saying that there's a, a, a long like philosophical debate tradition uh, of a debate about this invention, whether Adam actually just voiced names that those creatures already had, or did he invent them from um, ex nihilo, let's say. But that's kind of a, of a different, a different uh, topic, I guess. Alongside the biblical forming of man from mud, there is uh, another Greek myth, um, which is told by, uh, by Hesiod in uh, Works and Days, which was written approximately in the seventh century before Christ, about the forming of the first woman, Pandora. So in Greek mythology, the first woman is created by Zeus and other gods from mud. And the myth tells about the gift given by Zeus and by those gods to men. And this is uh, obviously a profoundly tragic gift, which is indeed the punishment for Prometheus' original gift, which is fire. So it's the prize that, uh, the, that humanity, and in, in this case, men, in the sense of biological masculine <laughs> creatures, uh, pay for that gift that they were given. So I'll just read uh, a passage from, from um, Works and Days. So said the father of men and gods and laughed aloud. And he, and he bade famous Hephaestus make haste and mix earth with water and to put it in the voice and strength of humankind and fashion a sweet, lovely maiden shape like of the immortal goddesses in face. And Athene to teach her needlework and her weaving of the varied web, and golden Aphrodite to shed grace upon her head and cruel longing and cares that weary the limbs. And he charged Hermes, the guide, the slayer of Argus, to put in her a shameless mind and a deceitful nature. So it's quite um, violent, what is uh, told about here. So it's uh, what Zeus decides is to gift humanity with a, um, uh, a panthenos, which is um, the, the, a, a woman which is modeled out of clay, out of mud, on the model of goddesses. Goddesses being the only kind of feminine creatures existing at the time. There were no human uh, females, only uh, godly females. And he does so, so he asks Hephaestus to model that, uh, that, um, uh, that young female, which was not necessarily to be a virgin, but to be in this prenuptial state. So a, a woman which is not yet married. Um, and 
he actually asks the other gods to gift her with her their most beautiful gifts. So kind of um, with 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 beauty, with the capacity to love, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what he actually asks is also Hermes to inflate or kind of um, uh, yeah to 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 breathe into her the most atrocious spirit, one of um, um, yeah, how to put it? He says shameless mind and deceitful nature. That's precisely that. So this capacity to um, to not not to lie, but to in a way to to incarnate something physically that is profoundly different and and almost opposite to what uh, her spirit is actually. And so he he ordered. And I will just read a, another passage. And they obeyed the Lord Zeus, the son of Cronos. Forthwith, the famous lame god molded clay in the likeliness of a modest maid, as the son of Kronos purposed. And the goddess bright eyed Athene girded and clothed her, and the divine graces and queenly persuasion put necklaces of gold upon her, and the rich head hours crowned her head with spring flowers. And Pallas Athene bedecked her form with all manners of finery. Also the guide, the slave of Argus, contrived within her lies and crafty words and a deceitful nature at the will of loud thundering Zeus, and the herald of the gods put speech in her. And he called this woman Pandora, all endowed, because all they who dwelt of Olympus gave each a gift, a plague to men who eat bread. So couple of um, more notes here. So Pandora, the all endowed precisely because she received all those incredible gifts, which makes her appearance absolutely godly like, but also make her nature profoundly evil in a way. So she's uh, gifted with words, but with words that carry lies. And um, just another point, which is quite uh, important is that, um, so Pandora is, uh, a plague to men who eat bread, precisely because Pandora comes in to humanity, humanity which uh, just previously, in the previous uh, kind of episodes of uh, works and days has been um, distinguished from, um, from the gods with whom they previously lived in a sort of a kind of harmonious um, life. And Zeus expelled humanity from Mount Olympus and asks Prometheus to do so. And in doing so, he, um, in a way, makes men eat bread because he makes men need to work in order to feed themselves. And he turns men into bellies. He turns men into bellies that need to be constantly fed. And this feeding requires work. And so they eat bread precisely because they eat something which requires a growing, a procreation, which is uh, possible through sperma, sperma being the term for the wheat seed. And so there is a strong connection in this yod between um, a strong analogy between this uh, needing to work and to inseminate the ground, the soil, the mud, and the woman. So the story of Pandora obviously doesn't stop there. It gets worse. Um, so she's, she, she comes to, to um, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought there was some. Um, she comes to men uh, and she's uh, given, a, given a jar by uh, Zeus. And she is instructed by Zeus to open the jar only when he orders it and in the absence of men. So in the kind of um, general culture, it's always believed that Pandora did it because she couldn't, you know, uh, resist the temptation of, um, of, opening, the, of opening the jar of, uh, you know, she couldn't resist uh, temptation, just like women generally in a profoundly, I would say, misogynistic cliches can never you know, resist temptation. But here, indeed, she was instructed by Zeus, and she did took uh, the lid of the jar um, off. And in doing so, she released evils and plagues across the earth, across the seas, that will cause the appearance of storms, of sicknesses, and most importantly, that would um, make man, man, 
or make humanity humanity in this uh, knowledge of its own finitude. So by bringing death, by bringing desperation, by bringing um, sickness and decay. But what she does is that she puts the, the, the lid back quite um, fast. And in doing so, she uh, doesn't allow all of, the, um, all of the spirits, all of the beings that were in the jar to actually escape. And so what Isyod writes is that only hope remained there in an unbreakable home within under the rim of the great jar and did not fly out the door. So all the, all the evil, all the plagues are released, but not hope. And so that's why man lives into this, according to uh, um, the great uh, historian and anthropologist Jean-Pierre Vernon, men are in a way trapped uh, with this knowledge of their finitude, but also this uh, incapacity, this uncertainty about what this finitude will come from and look like. So um, it's this, and, and so women in a way, if you want to look at it in a, let's say, more positive uh, way, probably is what actually makes men men, um, which turns the human nature into this kind of link in between the animal state and the transcendent godly um, being. But anyway, moving on. The, the, um, uh, so the story of Pandora is interesting because uh, as Jean-Pierre Vernon indicates, it's a profoundly ambiguous character, which is as ambiguous uh, as uh, human nature is profoundly. And so, the other name that Pandora goes by is Anesidora, she who makes present emerge from the deep, the goddess who presides to fecundity. So she comes with, again, this dual kind of uh, symbolism, which is she's uh, the, the carrier of death and diseases, but she's also the goddess who presides to fecundity. She is at once, as I was saying, um, yeah, no, I'm sorry, she's at once a purely passive kind of artificially created belly uh, and she's as passive as the, as the mud or the clay out of which she was made and she's as passive as the mud and the clay that needs to be inseminated by men uh, so she requires indeed to be inseminated by sperma just as the ground needs to be inseminated by the seed of uh, wheat but also she's the, the goddess of ground and fecundity a power of life and destruction at once so, and indeed, in, in this uh, um, kind of aspect, um, the myth of Pandora really um, kind of uh, embodies the, the Greek analogical tradition in which women and ground, agriculture and marriage are connected by man's power to sow both the matrix, the womb and the soil. So, back to Gosselin after this, uh, this episode. One other thing which is important uh, in, in, in this work uh, and which kind of allows me to just close this, um, this chapter on mud is um, also the interest in, uh, in this case, fringe sciences, or more precisely in this moment in which um, alchemy and chemistry were one and the same. Um, so in which what we would now regard as charlatanism and what we would now re regard as science were uh, in a way underlay by a similar form of rationality. And mud has a particular role in alchemy, precisely one uh, that is uh, central in processes of transmutation. Uh, and it's something that also is recurrent in, in, in French poetry, such as in uh, uh, Baudelaire, um, Charles Baudelaire, who in the Flowers of Evil speaks of a sort of a poetic alchemy. Uh, when he writes that um, he, in a way, extracted the quintessence of everything. And he says, you gave me mud and I turned it into, um, into gold. So precisely this uh, alchemical um, transubstantiation process. But so the mud between filth and fertility opens here the possibility of another lineage. So in my reading, it does one that is uh, this lineage, one that is engendered solely through um, the feminine from a melange of dirt and organic matter. So to think that further, one can precisely think of the title that uh, Laura Gozon gave uh, to her exhibition, which was Onanism Sorcery. So I'll concentrate on onanism I'll, and self-eroticism, and I'll just leave sorcery out for tonight. 
Um, and in an interesting manner, I would say that um, onanism is precisely what connects in my mind, at least um, the idea of mud, mud and soil in uh, its kind of biblical root. Um, in, I mean, it connects to that, but it connects to it in a manner that, um, that amounts to a refusal of procreation and to the interruption of the principle of conservation. Or, or that kind of twists that principle. And this is something that we can obviously discuss after. So onanism. Well, onanism is the synonym of masturbation, or also coitus interruptus. And it's a term that derives from the name of the son of Judah, Onan, in the Bible. Um, its his story is told in the Genesis. And um, Onan is um, uh, uh, guilty of a sin for which God actually punishes him with death, which is that of having refused the law of the Leveret. So this refusal led him to spill his seed, to spill his semen on the ground, wasting the fertile seed that God had gifted him with. And so just a quick word on what the Leveret is. Um, the Leveret is a custom that is still encountered in very, very few places today on earth, but which is mostly known in its kind of stronger um, uh, dimension, uh, in its stronger kind of um, version, through the tale that the Bible tells of it. So it takes its name from Levir, or Legevir, which means in law, uh, as the husband's brother, the brother in law. And it is considered in, uh, it, it, sorry, it consisted in a custom law uh, that obliged the male next of kin of a dead man to marry the widow in the case she didn't, uh, she was still childless at the time of the death. So if a woman remains a widow, a childless widow, because her husband passes, the brother of the husband is meant to marry the widow. So in its weak form, it was uh, considered to be uh, kind of um, a concern for women's rights because the family of the, um, the deceased husband would continue to take care of the husband's family. But in its original form, really, uh, such a law was designed to ensure the conservation of the lineage of the family name and of the inheritance through time. So marriage could not be broken in that understanding by the death of an individual. What prevailed was not the marriage amongst individuals, but amongst families. And so what prevailed was indeed the family and the family name, not the person's name. It implied the leverage, it implied a particular and limited game of substitution in place. So the brother, the one who, the, the levir, the, the brother-in-law, would only take the place of his dead brother through marriage, biologically so, but not legally nor symbolically. What it means is that the children that would eventually be born uh, from that union, from that second marriage with the Levir. Um, I'm sorry, did, uh, did Zurich disappear? Oh no, sorry, you're there. My bad. So yeah, so what it means is that the, um, the Levir, the children that would be born from that second union, so between the widow and the Levir, would be considered biologically as the children of the dead uh, husband, of the dead brother. So not only would they have uh, his name, but they would, the eldest son would inherit the goods and the name of the dead. So indeed, as the biblical verse says, an owner knew that the seed should not be his that in a way the posterity should not be his. So the levir, the in-law, operates in a way as a placeholder. So the authoritarian place of the patriarch is left fundamentally empty by the deceased, but the levir comes to occupy it without owning it in any manner that is outside of any property title or foundations. And so that's what allowed uh, the leverate to be um, considered as an exception to the laws of incest. Um, and it is indeed said in the Leviticus that you shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. And only the leverate allows to kind of um, 
go around, so to say, this uh, law of incest because the nudity is neither discovered nor consumed by the levy in person, but only transitively so by um, this um, capacity of the levir to only be a placeholder for his dead brother. So according, according to the Bible again, and precisely to the book of Deuteronomy, the fact that the firstborn conserves the name of the defunct patriarch uh, ensures that the name of the family will not be erased from Israel. So it breaks so yeah, the fact that Onan breaks with the leverate, that he refuses the leverate, that he refuses to inseminate his dead brother's widow, uh, and that rather he just spills his semen on the ground, is in a way a breaking of a pact um, that offenses God, but that also offenses his family and more largely offenses his people. So knowing that the seed should not be his, which also translates as knowing that the posterity should not be his. As I was saying, Onan just spills uh, his seed and it, he breaks with the principle of conservation that is indispensable to the reproductive process and to inheritance. And if one had to put it in, let's say, biological terms and to kind of paraphrase Jacques Monod, what Onan does is that he interrupts the transmission of the content of invariance that is equal to a quantity of information transmitted from a generation to the next. He, in a way, uh, refuses to ensure the specific, the, the inheritance of the specific structural norm. So, in my opinion, this um, story is interesting and important, I believe, because it kind of constitutes the pedestal upon which um, the moral condemnation of masturbation and onanism has been established. Uh, and you certainly know that um, onanism and masturbation have been um, yeah, completely rejected and, 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 and condemned throughout history. And in a way, interestingly, it plays out again in the mud, no? so the semen is spilled on the ground, only this time it doesn't kind of generate uh, anything. And, and Again, the, 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 um, there's this uh, you know, deprived and impure and filthy uh, kind of um, uh, nature of mud, which uh, plays, plays a role here. So it becomes interesting precisely to think about that impurity, to think about uh, this kind of um, anti-naturalist or denaturalizing uh, engendering, and in a way that profoundly connects, let's say, appropriation and pleasure. Uh, usefulness and uselessness and copulation and disconnection or looping and projection. But um, on onanism. So onanism, as I was saying, was um, you know, condemned um, both obviously theologically, religiously, but also morally and um, even medically so uh, throughout uh, centuries. And probably the most developed kind of um, moral and medicalized condemnation of onanism is found in, a, uh, in the book written by Samuel Auguste Tissot, uh, who's a Swiss, who was a Swiss uh, physician, a Swiss uh, naturalist. Um, so he was um, writing during the Enlightenment and he wrote this physical dissertation on the sicknesses produced by masturbation. Uh, his naturalistic approach, in a way, indexed sexual activity to a form of biological necessity that, in a way, came as the satisfaction of other physical needs. So, uh, in his opinion, um, sexual activity was to be regarded as uh, the purest form of preservatives of health. This idea that it only stemmed from physical needs, no? So the, the kind of complying with physical needs, with natural needs, was what would allow you to preserve your health. And a healthy life, indeed, was to be ruled by need and by occupation, uh, and had to, in a way, breed natural pleasures and natural usages, uh, rather than be, uh, you know, fostered and nurtured by imagination. So there was a strong condemnation of imagination, of um, excessive literacy, of excessive, let's say, um, culture, 
Uh, and what's interesting is that, uh, in a way, Tissot was um, uh, studying the natural men that to him were the peasants, that to him were the people of, um, you know, of the, of the countryside, the ones who were working on the ground, who were, you know, working to fertilize the earth. So, and it is in the peasants that he uh, identified what he considered to be healthy sexual activity. So that was the, um, the peasants, as I was saying, were for him the epitome of um, natural man. And he opposed them to urban dwellers, which, um, uh, you know, for him kind of had this uh, deprived, um, uh, sorry, not deprived, um, ah, the word doesn't come, let's, let's say impure and just um, kind of filthy and luxurious um, sexual attitude, sexual life. And what he identified in peasants was that, according oh, wow. to him, but that was also largely <laughs> Uh, debated and actually proven wrong by other epistemologists. But what he identified in peasants was that um, sexual activity was healthy because it was stemming from a reproductive urge. So it only depended on mechanical and quantitative factors. Specifically, the, the quantity of semen produced would you know, engage the healthy peasant to develop his sexual activity, but only after a, cer a certain age, because only when he would come into, let's say, maturity of his many fluids. And um, so that kind of mechanical and quantitative uh, approach to, to sexuality, he would um, oppose to the luxurious inventions and fantasies of, you know, Jean de Lettre and urban dwellers and people of the city. Um, and he would oppose that also to the workings of the mind. You know? So he had this profoundly, um, uh, he had, in a way, he had a, a way to look, uh, of looking at the peasants almost like colonialists would look at, you know, the salvages, but that's a different point. But so, so he, what he was um, interested in finding as an epistemologist, as a, as a, as a kind of a, a, um, uh, a specialist of medical questions was what he considered to be physical and moral degeneration. Uh, and this degeneration for him largely was engendered by sexuality and onanism more than any other type of sexuality uh, was in his opinion, the fruit of imagination, the subversive fruit of imagination, no? It, it couldn't be possibly, you know, um, uh, stemming from this sexually quantitative, healthy, you know, um, necessary um, kind of uh, sexual activity. So it threatens not only physical health, in his opinion, but also the moral normativity with which nature was endowed by Tissot. And human physical nature, therefore, was uh, understood by Tissot as having to be in a state of equilibrium. No? So just as nature, in his opinion, was, let's say, the, the bearer of morality and uh, um, in coming in the state of equilibrium, because, precisely because it was moral, so the individual organism had to, in its, like in, a, in, a, in its own skill, to be attuned to what nature was. And so to be in that state of equilibrium in order to be healthy, but also in order to be living a kind of a morally, um, um, yeah, a moral life, um, morally obedient to nature in a way. So the body had to be in a state of moderation. Uh, it didn't need to be, you know, it, it, sh it shouldn't generate any kind of, um, uh, excitement of the nerves, um, so excess, minima and maxima, um, intensity or scarcity were uh, states that were to be avoided at all costs. And what he saw right is that um, in, this, in this introduction, he writes that our bodies lose continuously. So we tend towards a state of disequilibrium. And if we did, did not recover the substance we lose, or if we did not repair our losses, we would rapidly fall victim to mortal weakness. And so man was to absolutely take care of his fluids 
and ensure that equilibrium out of which he was continuously pushed, um, yeah, out of which he was continually pushed. So he had to, in a way, repair his losses. And um, specifically, onanism, more than any other sexual activity, would generate this loss of fluids. The thing is that contrary to mating, this loss would not be repaired by the satisfaction of knowing that one has uh, engaged into a necessary uh, act of procreation. So it's just, you know, spilling and, and loss. So um, the loss of semen is the worst of all losses, as I was saying, and it precisely because it, it implies this radical quantitative misbalance of the bodily fluids and an excessive squandering of the valuable fluids that is beyond necessity. And that is, has to be fired by imagination. So imagination is the very source of this kind of um, extremely threatening activity that onanism is. So it amounts, in his opinion, to self-destruction by means of subjection to imaginary needs. And he talks about it in terms of suicide, which to him is not different from a self-inflicted gunshot or a voluntary drowning. So that's, that's kind of quite drastic. Um, but he has hope in humanity and he considers that the equilibrium, this lost equilibrium can be restored. It can be restored individually if one comes into reason by means of recognition of uh, one's own crime. So that would be through self-diagnosis and through somehow confession to uh, the, the doctor, but also collectively, you know, this kind of uh, loss of equilibrium can be restored and can be uh, surpassed if man, and in particular the Jean de Lettre, the literate would, and I quote, forget the existence of the sciences and books and become one nature made man, a peasant and a gardener. So that means that what Tissot was arguing for was a return to nature, but not one that would be like wild, spontaneous nature, but a nature that would come in a perfected state. So we're not, we're not talking about jungle, we're talking about gardens, huh? and gardens being places in which man kind of builds upon the incredibly, incredibly um, uh, divine and, and moral forces that uh, nature puts to his, um, to his uh, you know, disposal and kind of builds upon it to actually better nature and to perfect it. And nature then was endowed in Tissot's thinking, but in, in, in the thinking of many um, you know, scientists and philosophers of the enlightenment, it was endowed with the normative legislative moral legitimacy, the sole source of human moral actually, and it was funded upon necessity. So onanism's condemnation is due to its dangerousness, but it's justified, but it's an unnecessary character, different from nature, which works through a principle of necessity. And Tissot therefore did distance himself from the condemnation of Christianity, which condemns onanism as a sinful action because it procures sexual pleasure outside of marriage and procreation that was not his question, if there is any moral dimension in his condemnation, in his physiological condemnation, it's because onanism was believed to be the source of pathologies. And this uh, kind of the moral dimension of this condemnation lies in the argument that onanism abstracts from the physical necessity that rules over nature, nature being the normative source of all morals. And like excesses in literacy, onanism kind of refuses to comply with nature's injunctions. So in a way, and I'm not gonna make any point really, I'm just kind of assembling episodes and thoughts, but in a way, what it kind of engages me to do is to circle back to the idea of, of the artificiality that the myth of Pandora carries with regard to engenderment. So Pandora was this kind of divine creation, a completely artificial creation, and kind of invites me also to circle back to this uh, a making that is unnatural and that lies between necessity and transcendence. No? So 
through feminine onanism, what we could think of is the connection between women's fertility. Uh, it's, you know, what we could think of is that the connection between women's fertility and uh, men's capacity uh, is, is severed, and that there's a new power of self-engenderment that can be imagined, one that is not subjected, as I was saying, to biological necessities of mating. So, and this, I think, because you're reading now the Xenofeminist Manifesto, I think, or you've read it already, it, it strongly resonates with this claim that they make about anti-naturalism and about feminism being a rationalism or rather of rationalism that must be a feminism necessary. So onanism here, I think, could be thought of in terms of intellectuality, you know, if you connect it to the imagination that is at the heart of Tissot's uh, critique, it can be thought uh, uh, about in a manner that kind of interlaces our daily lives with abstraction, as it's written in the Xenofeminist Manifesto. It can be thought of in a manner that uproots human life from any naturality. And yet, to think of onanistic engendering, of a feminist onanistic engendering, would be a way to reconcile the intellectual existence with principles of conservation and transmission, that is to decorrelate onanism from the idea of dishumanization, to decorrelate it from the religious idea of pollution, and rather to think of it in non-appropriative terms, um, probably Michel Serre would be helpful here with the malpropre, with this idea of uh, why it is that we pollute, and it would be interesting to think of it with regard to ideas of conservation, of placing and naming. Another thing that would be interesting, interesting to think about, and which I won't, I mean, we can discuss it later if there's any time, but it's something that was um, surfacing in the early medicalizing condemnation of onanism during the Aufklärung, during the Enlightenment, was the question of the counterfeiting of nature. So the idea that um, onanism would have to do with imitation, with excessive imitation, not with this uh, counterfeiting of nature. And this is, I think, a question that would need to be opened up uh, and maybe discussed with regard to um, AI and specifically with recursive neural networks with GAN, no? which are profoundly uh, connected to this idea of automat automatization of mimesis. So maybe here, onanism and AI could be, you know, connected in some way. I see that time is running by. I just want to finish with two more episodes, short ones, I promise, that have to do with female engendering and naming. Because if you remember correctly, um, Adam is the one who gives the creatures names. And here I have, I think, two examples or two episodes about different um, forms of lineages. So one of them is the myth, a lot of myths tonight, uh, of Europa. And precisely in um, the, the version that is given of the myth by the poet, uh, the Greek poet Moskos. So the Greek poet Moskos writes about Europe, and he gives a specific version, which will then be followed by the one by Horatius and the one by Ovid. Uh, so the myth of Europa is the myth of this famous Phoenician princess, which is abducted and raped by Zeus, who transformed into a bull in order to lure her into, uh, you know, coming to Crete, and who will, from that union, um, procreate and give birth to princesses and also give her name to a continent. And Moskos is the only, and the first author to actually make this connection between the myth and the name of the continent. Um, so, and what he does and what he's the only one uh, doing, uh, the only author uh, doing it in, in Greece at the time is that, so he connects this um, geographical the name of the character with the geographical value of the name, but he does that through the telling of a premonitory dream that Europa makes the night before her bat. So in her dream, the Phoenician princess dreams of a fantastic lineage. So she's the daughter of um, a Phoenician king, but in her dream, 
She dreams that she is not anymore the daughter of the king, but rather the, the daughter of two mothers, two mothers that are two lands, that are two continents, that are fighting over her, um, uh, how would you say, her belonging. No? So the two mothers are fighting for that daughter. One is Asia, so Azida, and she's uh, her biological mother because uh, Europa, Europea comes from um, the fantasy from, uh, from Asia. And the other one uh, is presented as the antiperen. She doesn't have a name. She's the antiperen, which means the opposite. So the opposite with regard to Azida, with regard to Asia. And she's a land with no name. And in her dream, the princess makes a choice. She breaks with her original Phoenician um, descent and she chooses Uk Ai Kuzan, so without resistance, without being forced, and you can make here the connection with the, the rape, but here she chooses by herself without resistance to follow the other woman, to follow the anti -Beren. And by choosing the unnamed continent, Europa decides to give her name to it. So she's the adopted mother of the unnamed land. She's an abducted princess. And she names her own mother, her own adoptive mother, as she is named herself. She becomes a mother as she crosses the Aegean Sea, as she gives birth to the sons of Zeus. But she also becomes a mother, a mother in naming, uh, in naming an unnamed land, in naming a continent, in naming her own adoptive mother, so to say. So, in a way, she engenders herself as a daughter and as a mother, and she does so uh, in a gesture which is one of displacement and translation. Just a quick anecdote on the, the tale that Moscos write, which also innovates in the, in the literary tradition, and there's a really interesting point that Françoise Letoublon makes, is that um, Moscos is the only, write, only one who writes about um, kind of a, a basket, that um, Europa has. And it's the first time in Greek literature that there is what is characterized as a genealogy of objects, which is something which is done, for example, in the Odysseus, etc., but in which the genealogy is purely feminine. So this basket, we are told by Moscos, has been um, the, the um, property of women only and is passed on from women to women until it comes to uh, being the basket of Europa. So in a way, the, the tale, the epic, the, the, yeah, the myth as it is written by Moscos is also um, kind of transformed uh, within the epic tradition into a feminine key. And I will finish now, I promise, with one short story, which is by uh, the um, American sci-fi author Ursula Le Guin. I never know how to pronounce that. And I will read it with you if, um, if you're okay with it and you can read it also. And it's called uh, She Unnames Them. It was written and published, I'm sorry, in 85. So most of them accepted namelessness with the perfect indifference with which they had so long accepted and ignored their names. Whales and dolphins, seals and sea otters, consented with particular alacrity, sliding into anonymity and into, as into the element. A faction of Yorks, however, protested. They said that yak sounded right and that almost everyone knew they existed called them that. Unlike the ubiquitous creatures such as rats and fleas, who had called by hundreds of thousands of different names since Babel, the yaks could truly say, they said, that they had a name. They discussed the matter all summer. The councils of elderly females finally agreed that, through the, that though the name might be useful to others, it was so redundant from the yak point of view that they never spoke it themselves and hence might as well dispense with it. After they presented the argument in this light to their bowls, a full consensus was delayed only by the onset of severe early blizzards. Soon after the beginning of the thaw, the agreement was reached and the designation Yak was returned to the donor. 
Among the domestic animals, few horses had cared what anybody called them since the failure of Dean Swift's attempt to name them after their own vocabulary. Cattle, sheep, swine, asses, mules, and goats, along with chickens, cheese, turkeys, all agreed enthusiastically to give their names back to the people to whom, as they put it, they belonged. A couple of problems did come up with pets. The cats, of course, steadfastly denied after having had any name other than those self-given, unspoken, ineffably personal name, names which, as the poet named Elliot said, they spent long hours daily contemplating, though none of the contemplators has ever admitted that they were contemplate, that what they contemplate is their names, and some onlookers have wondered if the objects of that meditative gaze might not in fact be the perfect or platonic mouse. In any case, it is a moot point now. It was with the dogs and with some parrots, lovebirds, ravens, and minas that the trouble arose. These verbally talented individuals insisted that their names were important to them and flatly refused to part with them. But as soon as they understood that the issue was precisely one of individual sorts and that anybody who wanted to be called Rover or Fufu or Polly or even Birdie in the personal sense was perfectly free to do so, not one of them had the least objection to parting with the lowercase or as regard German creatures uppercase generic appellations poodle, parrot, dog, or bird, and all the linen qualifiers that had trailed along behind them for 200 years, like tin cans tied to a tail. The insects parted with their names in vast clouds and swarms of ephemeral syllables buzzing and stinging and humming and fitting and crawling and tunneling away. As for the fish of the sea, the names dispersed from them in silence throughout the oceans like faint dark blurs of cuttlefish ink and drifted off on the currents without a trace. None were left now to a name, and yet how close I felt to them when I saw one of them swim or fly or trot or crawl across my way or over my skin or stalk me in the night or go along beside me for a while in the day. They seemed far closer than, they, than when their names had stood between myself and them like a clear barrier. So close that my fear of them and their fear of me became one same fear and the attraction that many of us felt, the desire to feel a rubber caress on another's scale or skins or feathers or fur, taste of another's blood or flesh, keep one another warm, that attraction was now all one with the fear and the hunter could not be told from the hunted nor the eater from the food. This was more or less the effect I had been after. It was somehow somewhat more powerful than I had anticipated. But I could not now, in all conscience, make an exception for myself. I resolutely put anxiety away, went to Adam and said, you and your father lent me this, gave it to me actually. It's been really useful, but it doesn't exactly seem to fit very well lately. But thanks very much, it's really been useful. It is hard to give back a gift without sounding peevish or ungrateful, and I did not want to leave him with that impression of me. He was not paying much attention, as it happened, and said only, put it down over there, okay, and went on with what he was doing. One of my reasons for doing what I did was that talk was getting us nowhere, but all the same I felt a little left down. I had been prepared to defend my decision, and I thought that perhaps when he did notice he might be upset and want to talk. I put some things away and fiddled around a little, but he continued to do what he was doing and to take up notice, no notice of anything else. At last I said, well, goodbye dear, I hope the garden key turns up. He was fitting parts together and said without looking around, okay, fine, dear, when's dinner? I'm not sure, I said, I'm going now. With the, I hesitated and finally said, with them, you know, and went out and went on out. In fact, I had only just then realized I ha how hard it would have been to explain myself. I could not chatter away as I used to do, taking it all for granted. My words must be as slow, as new, as single, as tentative as, as the steps I took going down the pathway away from the house, between the dark, branched, tall dancers motionless against the winter shining. <laughs>